Hello YouTube, welcome to another chapter in my ongoing overly ambitious DIY adventures. I sadly don't have a full video for this week because my current project, remaking this slingshot, will probably span multiple weekends. And since I've been on travel for work the past few days, editing time has been hard to come by. But I wanted to take a few minutes this week to share this work in progress and explain a little bit about my slingshot's background as well as my motivations for making it. This project was supposed to be a simple repair job for damaged pieces of a pump-action hexnut slingshot I built last summer. After a couple dozen uses, key pieces had either worn out or been destroyed. But after stripping apart my slingshot, which I called the P50, I decided my original workmanship was too awful to reuse. Plus, I wanted to develop a proper set of blueprints to go with the P50 so that any other intrepid builders could replicate this toy if they so desired. The biggest problem with my original slingshot, aside from my inability to cut straight lines by hand, was flexibility. One of the wonderful things about buying lumber is that the name of an item doesn't actually reflect what it is. 2x4s, for example, don't actually have a 2 inch by 4 inch cross section. When I was designing the P50, I figured a pair of quarter inch plywood layers would form a sufficiently wide channel to guide a half inch hex nut which has a thickness of 7 16ths of an inch. It turns out I was totally wrong. Quarter inch plywood is closer to 3 16ths of an inch thick, and I ended up stacking washers to compensate for the missing thickness. The downside to doing this was that the layers of wood slipped relative to each other. This meant that my slingshot wasn't nearly as stiff as it could have been. Not that it would have really helped accuracy or anything, but it didn't make me feel very safe drawing back a full power shot and hearing the entire barrel creak. Another problem was that my plywood catch had delaminated under tension. The stresses of holding back the paracord had sheared off a corner of the hook. It still worked, but you had to be very careful when drawing back the rubber for a shot. Sometimes the paracord slipped off the catch at inopportune moments. By increasing the radius of curvature on the hook, I'm hoping to make this piece a little bit more durable. The last change I wanted to make was to glue the slingshot together into two halves to make assembly and disassembly easier. On the Mark 1, I was always fighting the curvature of my warped plywood pieces as I tried to align all of the bolt holes. By adhering several layers of wood together, not only will I have fewer pieces to keep track of, but the lamination process locks the wood into laying flat. I created an SVG for all of the smaller pieces to cut out on the CNC but the larger pieces I still had to shape by hand. I was able to use the manual jog function to turn the shape oko into a drill press and to straighten out some of the edges that I had butchered with a jigsaw. Hopefully the P50 Mark II ends up looking a little better than the original. Alright, I'm going to stop here on the build process just to save some footage from my actual making of video later, but I also want to say a quick something about what inspired me to make the Mark 1 and why I think machines like the Shape Oko 2 are going to become as huge as 3D printers are today. I've always been a huge fan of people like Adam Savage or Ben Heck or Tony Swatton. If you've ever watched any of their videos, your first reaction was probably something like mine. Holy crap, I wish I could do something like that. And after many years of lamenting the fact that my undergraduate education didn't satisfy all of my desires to design, invent, and create, I decided to put my foot down and do something about it. I'd get my lazy self out of the computer room and make my way to fun. Jörg Sprov's Pump Action Nut Shooter was one of the first things I saw that I thought was both mechanically elegant and feasible to build with the limited tools at my disposal. Plus, who doesn't like playing with a slingshot? Gratuitous destruction is something the inner child in all of us can appreciate. So I built my own version of York's Hexnut Shooter over the course of many weekends, and learning to make things slowly and sometimes painfully by hand was a very satisfying process. But there comes a time when you want to do more, and you want to do it with absolute digital precision. So as the Mythbusters would say, if you can't do it yourself, build a robot to do it for you. And that's where desktop CNC milling comes in. Having that capability opens up so many options for individual makers. 3D printers are nice, but when you need the durability of wood, or cast plastics, or even metal, there's only one option. Subtractive manufacturing. The Shape Oko is one of many solutions out there that allow you to do this, but in terms of bang for your buck and providing an educational DIY experience, I think it's one of the best CNC kits on the market. You won't confuse it for a shop bot, but I think it does an excellent job of lowering the barriers to entry in desktop milling. And that brings us a huge step closer to a personal industrial revolution, a day when people are limited only by their creativity and anyone can be an engineer. You won't have to outsource small manufacturing jobs, sites like Etsy will grow exponentially, and a big organization will probably complain about people quote unquote pirating a table or something. Okay, ideally not the latter, but hopefully you get my point about why I'm so excited that affordable and frankly game-changing tools like the Shapeoko exist. And that's why I'm sharing my personal CNC adventure on YouTube in the hopes that other people will join me in creating new things, inspiring others, and most importantly, having fun. 
That's it for today. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in a week or two.